Hello everyone, welcome to Arcade Lacking. Today's video is going to be a very special video. The subject of this video is an in-depth history, at least as in-depth as I can get the subject to be within, you know, a two-hour or so time span, <clears throat> an in-depth history of the hunting, horticultural, agricultural, and land management practices in North America, both during pre-Columbian times and after the 1492 contact between the European colonizing nations and the indigenous peoples of North America. <clears throat> so most of us know what North America is to a point, depending on who you ask. Uh, but for the purposes of this video, <clears throat> North America is going to consist of Mexico and the Maya, including the Maya homeland in Guatemala, Belize, and uh, southern Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico, the United States, Canada, and Greenland. Now, I could, of course, cover the uh, most the rest of Central America and the Caribbean. However, <laughs> due to how broad and lengthy this subject is and how lengthy this video is already going to be, the rest of Central America the Carib and the Caribbean will be in a separate video on the agricultural practices of these regions alongside the agricultural practices of South America. <clears throat> so before we get into the meat of the video, we need to define some terms, uh, specifically these that you see listed here. So first is hunting. Now, we, we all have an idea of what hunting is. Um, for example, I live in the southeastern United States where hunting is very big and we have specific seasons. In fact, most of the U.S. has those seasons, including in the, the Midwest and the Great Basin era, area. But still, uh, we, we need to, um, to define this. So hunting, for the purpose of this video, is the activity of hunting wild animals or game for food. I make this distinction because, of course, in our modern life, we have um, sports hunting and things like that. Uh, and then we have horticulture, which is the cultivating of plants and gardens to produce food and medicinal ingre uh, ingredients. Uh, and this actually in itself has a broad definition that we'll get into in the video as well. And then we have agriculture, which are practices of farming, including the cultivation of soil for the growing of crops and the rearing of animals to provide food, wool, and other products. And we know this very well in our modern society. We have a lot of huge industrial farms growing corn uh, and beans, rice, etc. As well as we have things like um, cattle farms and sheep farms as well. Then we come to the last two definitions, which are very important for the video uh, itself. The first of these is the primary idea of primary force efficiency, which in its most simplistic term that we have here is a subsistence strategy which involves the selective harvesting of nuts, berries, and other, and other vegetables, and possibly fish and shellfish as these become seasonally available while also supplementing these with the continuous year-round hunting of, um, of land and water animals. Uh, which, again, this is going to be a key component for this video. And then the other key component for the video is the idea of controlled burns. So controlled burns are a land management technique in which fire is intentionally applied to vegetation, and monitored in order to reduce the risk of wildfires, as well as to co cultivate de uh, excuse me, desired food sources in fire-resistant trees. <laughs> okay, so now that we've got all the, those terms defined, out, those defined terms out of the way, we're going to go back to the beginning of human habitation uh, and settlement in 
the North American continent. Now, it should be clear that this date I have right here, 40,000 years ago, um, is, is, all, is ever changing, and there are some debates, some sites that could be uh, older. In fact, there probably are sites that are older, but the oldest sites that we have um, discovered in the past couple of years actually date to around the, this time, about 40,000, give or take, years ago. Uh, and this time period is the, uh, it's called the paleo Indian period, but it can also be called the Paleolithic period, depending on how you want to look at it. Paleolithic being what is used for the old world um, of Asia and Europe and Africa and such, and Paleo Indian used for North America, Central America, and South America. I tend to think that really just separating these is kind of pointless because <laughs> humans on uh, both in the uh, North America, Central America, and South America, and in Europe, Asia, and Africa went down very similar trajectories. So why distinguish them that much? Is it, it just uh, it, it's personal preference. I, I can see why some people might want to do it, but at the same time, I don't feel like it should be as dogmatic as it is. Anyways, <clears throat> so the for the longest time, the idea of humans entering North America, this are the American continents, um, was first postulated to be the Bering Strait. Theory, it, essentially, an idea that uh, that the ancestors to Native Americans, First Nations peoples, came across a land bridge that had developed due to lowering sea levels, uh, as well as due to the receding of glacial plates, uh, or allowed the the ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas to come across from Asia into North America and eventually South America roughly around twelve to 13,000 years ago. However, <laughs> this is no longer the predominant theory for a lot of reasons that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, because a huge host of evidence has shown that, well, yes, uh, the, many of the ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas did come across the Bering Land Bridge. They were only like the last <laughs> in a succession of you know, settling groups who came across a variety of ways. The most likely and common scenario is the idea of the Kelp Highway, where essentially the ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas sailed along the coasts of North, South, uh, sorry, of North Central America and South America and settled as needed. Uh, between uh, what we now know is around... 37,000 years ago to even uh, as late as 16,000 years ago, uh, give or take. Uh, and of course, there are other ways as well, <clears throat> but this is the predom this is the predominant idea of what they did, and also as well as theories that they went back and forth as well. So one might ask, being the subject of this video, is hunting and ag agricultural practices. If these uh, ancient ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas sailed across this coast, you know, this long coast of North America, Central America, and South America, what did they eat? You know, they, they had to get food somewhere. Well, it's, it's very simple. In fact, the <laughs> answer to the question is in the name, the Gale Poway. Uh, and that's because... Seaweed and kelp are an abundant food source that is, has been used for thousands of years and is still used today. So, of course, uh, for example, sushi in Japan, uh, one of the key ingredients is often seaweed. Anyways, so, of course, these and the ancestors to the indigenous peoples of the Americas used, <laughs> utilized this abundant food source. Now, it should be clear that the coast of the North American, Central American, and South American continents was a lot further out. In fact, probably up against this line, the, the blue line that you see here, due to the low sea levels. So, 
it's hard to see the archaeological sites that are now probably, you know, several hundred, if not several thousand feet under the ocean. But we have other lines of evidence. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but also they utilized fish or probably utilized fish. I mean, we don't, again, it's hard to determine the evidence based off of that. But it's, I'd say it's about a 90% accurate assumption that they would use fish as food. But not only that, once they landed and put their settlements together, they would utilize animals that we recognize today due to our modern and popular culture, thanks to things like Jurassic World and the movies Ice Age and things like that, uh, that we call megafauna, which include mammoths and mastodons. This is a mammoth. Uh, which we can see uh, large amounts of evidence uh, from several mammoth kill sites, such as the ones seen here in the Colorado Plateau, where our oldest uh, evidence of human settlement in the North American continent is found, uh, dated to around 37,000 years ago. Uh, which, to be clear, uh, while this is the age of 37,000 years ago, I made the human settlement of North America about 40,000 years ago because one would assume it would take a little while to get here. And while it probably took a lot quicker, I'm going, you know, splitting down the middle and assuming they were here longer along, along the coast. Anyway, so in this site, we found, we, the archaeologists have found uh, pretty good evidence that humans... Uh, the, the ancient ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas were here around at least 37,000 to 40,000 years ago uh, because they found a, what I just alluded to, a mammoth kill site where, as you can see here, the bones of a mammoth uh, were found with a lot of butcher marks, uh, such as uh, bone flakes being missing in these lines, uh, and a variety of other things. Uh, further evidence that humans were here, other than the fairly clear butcher marks, like you see here, uh, cut marks here, as well as marks um, from, let's see, what does D say here? Yeah, such as rib fragments being broken in specific ways, uh, as well as. Um, bone flakes being broken off, uh, we find the tools that they use to butcher these mammoths, or at least some of the tools we, that they use. And that is micro flakes that you see right here, uh, or a chirp micro flake. Um, and these are pretty definitive indicators that humans were here butchering mammoths, uh, whether they killed them with spears or used... Um, jumping sites, sort of like bison jump sites that I'll talk about in just a couple of minutes, uh, is unknown, but either way, they were clearly butchering mammoths during this period of time. Uh, and as you can see, you can see the cutting edge of the chert flake right here, uh, and as well as right here, and there's a the um, striking platform and the bulb uh, percussion. So, to be clear, how do we, what, what do we know, uh, how do we know the difference between a flake, a scraper, or a cutting tool, and just some random rock that happened to be broken off due to natural processes. Well, for one thing, you have things like the bubble percussion and the striking platform. So the striking platform is when you take the uh, a rock and bang on the parent material of the chert or flint, depending on whether you're from America or Europe, they're the same thing. Uh, and it's a good indicator that this was not natural, though it's not always clear, because it could still be natural, but pretty good indicator that it's not natural based off of the striking platform, which is this often oval or triangular, uh, sometimes rectangular, flat surface that shows that somebody was repeatedly banging on a specific area to get off flights, uh, as well as the bulb percussion, which is a is it exactly what it's called, a bulb on the back that shows uh, the impact force that removed it. 
And then we also have little flake scars and retouch showing that you, around these edges, um, showing that it was used, to, it was sharpened in order to be used for cutting, which is not something that natural processes really do. <laughs> so this, while the evidence is sparse, only showing a mammoth with um, cut marks and broken uh, bones uh, and only a couple of flakes, it's still enough evidence to show us that humanity, that ain't the ancient ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas were already here 37,000 to 40,000 years ago uh, and were utilizing one of their main food sources, which are the mammoths. We also, and, and this is just a map of the various mammoth kill sites uh, that have been found throughout America. Again, here's the Colorado lands, uh, Colorado um, Plateau and various other things in Nevada, uh, as well as in Washington. Uh, but we also know that the ancient ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas were already utilizing a food source that they would continue to utilize well into the 1870s and 1890s, depending on the uh, cultural group, and that is bison. We know them as buffalo, but really they're bison. Buffalo is something else. Uh, and we know the, uh, how they killed them to a pretty good degree. One, of course, they would hunt them down with spears and uh, atlals and various other things, but they would use a killing method that would be continued to be used well up into the 1650s uh, until the adoption of the horse, which was reintroduced into the Americas by Europeans. And that is the buffalo jump, or essentially... It is what you see here. Uh, various indigenous hunting parties would lure and scare and do whatever they could to induce herds of buffalo to charge towards predetermined cliffs and jump sites where they would, as you can see, topple over the edge and fall to their, if not their deaths, at least to be very broken and bloodied, which would then allow the hunting party to go in and kill off anybody who was still alive and therefore harvest the food. And we can see this evidence in the sheer number of buffalo jump sites that we found. Uh, many of them, a, a good chunk of them being found in the Colorado, uh, sorry, the Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, Idaho, um, in Alberta, Canada area, as well as a few being, such as Bonfire Shelter, which you see here, being found in Texas. And again, this is Bonfire Shelter. Uh, and Bonfire Shelter was, you know, it, it designed like this, uh, the cliff roof and things like that. Uh, and we can know that they were killing bison here, uh, again, similar to the mammoth, based off of the evidence of butchering that has been found on the mammoth bones present, uh, with cut marks being seen here on this femur, as well as on these bones, um, and then also uh, marks that are done to break the bone and puncture the bone, seen here by these circles. Uh, we also see others in thing, areas such as uh, Jake Bluff here in Oklahoma, where we have found a whole lot of bison bones that had been butchered alongside uh, Clovis and Folsom and other in points types of points made by indigenous peoples present as well, making it pretty clear what the site was used for. Um, there's really very few uses that, that, that these uh, could be used for. And I don't, I don't want to make them sound like they're not advanced or not useful at all. It's just it's pretty clear what point, spear points were used for. <clears throat> 
but it wasn't they didn't just utilize these animals um as you can see in this image north america had a diverse set of fauna when the indigenous sorry the ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the americas arrived uh, they had horses. Yes, horses were here before the Europeans reintroduced the horse. Um, they had died out, uh, died out, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, ground sloths, of course, uh, saber-toothed cats, as well as cave lions, uh, American lions, which were actually bigger than African lions, uh, dire wolves, timber wolves, and a variety of other things. Uh, but the possibly the most important animal that was utilized by the ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas were dogs. That's right, they brought dogs with them. We know they have a pretty good, uh, have a pretty good idea where, you know, the, of uh, the kinds of dogs that they brought, as well as how many. In fact, we know that they came again from the Alaska, Russia area, probably around the Kelp Highway, and the later ones came through uh, the Bering Strait packs. Uh, in fact, these dogs would go on to uh, how to put this, they would go on to be uh, inter interbreed with each other and be the progenitors of a large number of pre-Columbian dog breeds, um, which many, some of which are here today, some of which are no longer here. Um, two ones that are still here uh, can be seen in the Carolina dog and, of course, the Chihuahua. These little devils that were uh, <laughs> that were domesticated and bred in Mexico and Mesoamerica. And I want, on that note, I want to make it clear to uh, any uh, of the indigenous peoples of Mesoamerica, I'm not just hating on the Chihuahua. I'm also hating on European dogs of similar size, like the Pomeranian, that have similar temperaments. I'm sorry, for whatever reason, small dogs across the board, regardless of what comment, are little jackasses. So, <laughs> so I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> uh, now, it is important to note that these dogs that the indigenous peoples of the Americas brought with them, why they're so important is because, well, for one, the obvious thing, they helped in hunting the megafauna uh, that was present in the Americas, which gave various indigenous communities, um, ancestral indigenous communities, a leg up. Uh, because, of course, it's a lot easier to uh, track something and hunt something down with dogs. I mean, we still do this in our modern day with coon hounds and uh, Great Danes and various other things, you know, other dogs bred for hunting. But another thing that was an important factor, uh, and uh, obviously an unknown factor to the indigenous peoples of the Americas at the time, because germ theory was not a thing, uh, was that these dogs par uh, probably carried some diseases that hurt the megafauna present in North America. Probably not to the same degree of, say, when the Europeans came in in, in the 1492 onwards and brought their things like smallpox and such, but it was probably still a significant factor into why the megafauna died out, as well as the fact that humans hunted these things as well as dogs. Um, which brings me into uh, the, the last part of the section, what happened to the megafauna? Well... For one thing, for the longest time, the idea there was an idea that the ancestors of the indigenous peoples of the Americas, uh, when they came into the Americas, they just were insatiable killers of the megafauna, and they hunted them into extinction. Which, honestly, is a little bit too simplistic, and it probably is not what the case is. Uh, for one thing, yes, hunting probably did play a certain degree. Again, the dogs, hunting, the use of dogs and hunting as well as um, things like bison jump sites uh, and such did kill off large amounts of megafauna at a time. But at the same time, again, these were continued well into the 1650s CE with bison 
in the bison were never hunted to extinction by those hunting techniques and dogs were used in hunting them as well. So that doesn't really make sense. Uh, and then, of course, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, there was also the disease factor. I mean, we know the disease probably from dogs and probably even humans a little bit uh, play, may have played a little bit of a factor and the extension of the megafauna. But the biggest effect was most likely an event known as the Younger Dryas event, or essentially, as this graph shows, uh, before the Younger Dryas event, uh, the North American continent was a lot cooler uh, by at least a 5% to even uh, 25, sorry, even 15% difference. And so what this means when the Younger Dryas event happened, which was a, a rise in temperature uh, and decrease in ice and the receding of glaciers, uh, means that the animals, the megafauna that have been adapted to this colder environment, the mastodons, the woolly mammoths, the uh, North American lions, etc., etc., were no longer uh, evolutionarily adapted, evolutionarily fit for survival in this environment. Uh, so many of them began to die out because food began to become scarcer, whether it be the grass and other plant food uh, that allowed the large megafauna like mammoths to survive. And then of course, by proxy, the as the mammoths began to die out, um, it began to become less food for the large predators like the saber-toothed cats and the North American lions. So there you have it. That's what, uh, what happened to most of the megafauna. Of course, the bison and things like the moose and such, uh, and even bears still existed, uh, still exist now uh, and continue to exist. But this is what happened to the great majority of the megafauna that was present in North America. Uh, as well as the megafauna that was present in a lot of Asia and Europe as well. So, now we move on to our next section, which is Mesoamerica and the origin of agriculture in North America. So, Mesoamerica for, uh, is essentially uh, usually just defined as uh, Mexico, uh, whether it be northern Mexico, uh, the Gulf Coast of Mexico or the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, and Honduras. Though, of course, this is a lot sometimes a lot more fluid, as sometimes the American Southwest is included in that as well. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to use this definition of Mesoamerica. So, Mesoamerica saw the rise of a large, uh, a large array of very advanced and very sophisticated civilizations. Uh, you had the Olmec here uh, in the orange. Um, of course, you had uh, other high Mesoamerican cultures like Teotihuacan, um, which popped up around here, uh, the Maya, and then, of course, eventually the Aztec more properly known as the Triple Alliance because it was actually three different city-states who allied together. Uh, and of course, like this is going to be a common thread throughout most, uh, throughout the whole video, one of their main food staples was through hunting, as seen in this Maya, excuse me, this Maya cliff right here where they're hunting a deer. Because of course, humanity throughout most of its history, alongside agriculture, hunt, ate meat and hunted and got meat through hunting. In fact, we can see in uh, archaeological assemblages, sort of the the how to put this, the most sought after uh, meat sources by the Mesoamerican societies, uh, such as the Maya right here, where we can see that there was uh, a lot of howler monkey, tapir, jaguar, um, peccary, uh, white-tailed deer, etc with a large degree of deer um, and monkey and jaguar and tapir being found. Now, of course, it should be clear that, as stated in this little graph right here, um, 
we don't know the population density based off of the art uh, the archaeological record but we do know the uh amounts of animals that are found in the uh the various sites that were excavated which again doesn't tell how populous the uh the fauna was in mesoamerica but does tell what they most sought after but and also they utilized uh, again another common thread uh, they domesticated and utilized dogs. Uh, one of the most common and still around ones being the this one right here. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it so as not to uh, butcher it and offend the indigenous peoples of Mesoamerica who still uh, have this domesticated dog. But as you can see in this Maya glyph, they have a very long history in Mesoamerican culture and society uh, and could be used for a variety of things such as hunting and protection. But the most important thing to come out of Mesoamerica is the origin of agriculture in North America uh, with the oldest uh, domesticated plants being squash and shortly after maize as well as beans. Uh, in fact, the most amazing of these things, actually before that, uh, it should be important to note, squash was actually domesticated. Uh, it's one of the most, one of the earliest plants and food sources domesticated in the history of the world, uh, being domesticated nearly 10,000 to even 11,000 years ago in um, both Mesoamerica and in uh, the Andes, which again, that's going to be a separate video. Uh, but, as I said, the most amazing agricultural feat that Mesoamerica did was the domestication and development of corn. So, we know corn based off of what corn looks like in the modern era, which are these large stalks that we can either grow ourselves in a farm or we can buy in the grocery store. But that's not how corn started. So corn actually started out as teosinte, this tiny form of weed, not weed, wheat, that actually still exists today. You can actually find wild forms of teosinte. And they have been definitively proven using... Uh, archaeogenetic and paleo and archaeobotanical methods to prove that modern day corn and maize uh, came from this tiny little stalk of wheat. Um, and eventually with the domestication of maize uh, we begin to get new farming methods. Uh, for one thing due to the marshy state of much of the of Mesoamerica, like the Maya Lowlands, uh, sorry, Maya, yeah, Maya Lowlands, uh, the cultures of Mesoamerica began to practice raised agricultural fields, as you can see here, uh, still used to this modern day, where they would, were in communities will pile large mounds of dirt, like here, and then surround it with, you know, in marshy areas so that when it fills them with water, they can still come on and farm. Uh, in fact, as I said, here's another example being still, still being used today. The Aztec, uh, the Triple Alliance, the Aztec Empire of the Triple Alliance took it to a whole nother level and created what are known as chinpa, uh, ch uh, chinapas, where essentially in the Lake of Mexico, they, due to them building a city in the center of the Lake of Mexico, you know, they had a, they had a question of like, well, how are we going to farm in the center of a large lake? Raised agriculture. And so they created these raised agricultural fields that they could farm on and just take themselves around on this boat right here, or boats like this, like, say, in a canal at Venice, and come by and tend their fields, which is very innovative. Uh, 
and well thought out. And it's why they were able to produce such large scale amounts of maize and beans and squash and other things like that. Uh, and then the uh, one of the most expansive agricultural methods that they developed in Mes that was developed in Mesoamerica, one that began to spread all the way across North America, Central America, and South America. Uh, is a method known as the Three Sisters Method, where essentially first you plant the corn, uh, and then once it gets to a certain height, you plant the beans, which you use the corn as a stock, and also put nitrogen into the soil, making it far more nutrient-dense for, uh, for the corn. And then eventually, you uh, later on, last, you plant the squash, which fans out and, pre and prevents weeds from growing. So you can produce large amounts of food using this symbiotic method, agricultural method. And again, this, this was such an innovative method that it spread across the Americas like wildfire. Uh, they also, Mesoamerica, the cultures of Mesoamerica also utilized plants like the rubber tree, which you can see uh, being milked is what it's called here, uh, which they used to create rubber objects like this rubber ball used in the ball games, uh, the ball games that were endemic in Mesoamerica, uh, as well as cotton, uh, specifically highland cotton which was used to create textiles as seen in this Aztec manuscript. Sorry, this Triple Alliance manuscript from the Triple Alliance. So they had, uh, the cultures of Mesoamerica not only developed agriculture, but they mastered it <laughs> and then produced it on a highly advanced scale. Uh, they also utilized cacao, chocolate, which we can see here, uh, and which they would use ceremonial, ceremonially as a sort of ecstatic dr religious drink, uh, which they would froth and using and drink and froth using these cups that you see right here. Um, that's also displayed here in this, um, I believe, Maya glyph. Where, where they're frothing chocolate. Okay, so now we've we've looked at Mesoamerica and its development of agriculture in for the rest of North America. Now we're going to go on to the next section, and that is the closest region to Mesoamerica, the American Southwest. So the American Southwest, it broadly is. Uh, Southern is Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Southern California. Um, usually Southern Nevada, Utah, and Colorado, and then all of New Mexico and Arizona and Southern California. Uh, and it was home to the development of a variety of very sophisticated cultural groups, such as the Hohokam, the Mogollon culture, and the ancestral Puebloans, um, who you might know as the Anasazi, but that is a derogatory term. The correct term is ancestral Pueblo, uh, which were some of the earliest cultures to develop in these regions that, that, that you see here. Uh, but also you had cultures, the cultures of Southern California, such as the Serrano culture, uh, the Choia culture, uh, the uh, the Ketchon culture. Uh, sorry if I've butchered any of these. Uh, as well as eventually the coming of uh, and development of cultures, whether they were had migrated here from further north or were descendants of the ancestral Pueblo in the Hohokam and the Magayon, uh, cultures such as the uh, various Apache groups, uh, the Hopi, the Navajo, the Zuni, uh, etc. Uh, this area was also, uh, so these societies developing here created very sophisticated cities as well, uh, such as 
Chaco Can the Chaco Canyon Ceremonial Center, which was a very large building and possibly ceremonial city, village, what have you. Um, Casa Grande that was built by the Hohokam, I believe. In fact, we'll go back and double check that. Uh, yes, Casa Grande was the Hohokam. And as you can see by its name, it was <laughs> rather large. Uh, and these societies who built these large cities like Chaco Canyon and uh, and Casa Grande subsisted on a variety of food methods. Uh, one, hunting. They hunted rabbits, uh, deer, and turkey, um, which we can see here. In fact, the hunting may have actually been divided by class. So is what you can see here are two graphs. You see this graph here uh, where the uh, it's basing percentages of artidactyl animals. Um, essentially, artidactyl animals are deer uh, or other hooved animals uh, that have, sorry, other even hooved animals. Uh, hooved animals that have a single hoof like horses uh, and mules and burrows and things like that are equids. Uh, but artidactyl uh, animal bones, most likely deer. Uh, and then a percentage of turkey bones. And you can see uh, turkey, for the most part, uh, made up the majority of the animal percentages, uh, specifically during Pueblo, the Pueblo Three period, with the exception of deer right here. Uh, being seen right here, where uh, in the Pueblo Three period, with the exception of this one little area here, for the most part, there were uh, not uh, deer bones. <clears throat> and you can see this again over here in this graph, right in these graphs right here, showing across the time period the amount of aerodactyl bones, which were predominantly in. Uh, the first part, uh, and then he, around the earliest part of Pueblos 2 and 3, uh, and then same for Turkey. And then we can see the also the percentages of Turkey bones based off of region, where you can see the majority of Turkey bones were found in region 1 and region 3, uh, with the decent amount being found in uh, regions four, five, and six. And so what this tells us is essentially there was, pro whether it be the turkey, uh, essentially what it tells us is turkey and deer were divided socially. So one region, some regions like region two and region seven probably ate more deer, whereas regions one and three, and then a little bit of regions four, five, and six ate a lot of <clears throat> uh, ate a lot of turkey. And so this tells us either this was a class division where a higher social class ate more deer or ate more turkey, or it was a regional division based off of abundance depending on region. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. Uh, so again, we'll go back and you can see just the index values of uh, how much deer was consumed, how much turkey was consumed uh, during this time periods, and how much deer was consumed. And across the board, with the exception of during the basket uh, maker two and Pueblo one period, turkey was consumed more, and specifically in more specific regions. We, again, uh, another common thread, we know also know that dogs were domesticated in the Southwest as well, as, you can, as been, has been found in um, 
ceremonial burial context of specific dog breeds and the presence of dog art, like these little clay figurines. And eventually, after contact with Europeans, very, some tribes, like the Navajo, would domesticate sheep. As seen like here. As seen right here, which they could produce, um, used to produce a large amounts of food on hand, as well as wool. And then, of course, eventually, the ver various tribes like the Navajo and the Apache would adopt the horse as well, which would help them both in warfare and hunting. Not all tribes. Um, many of the uh, Puebloan communities were very clearly, based off of archaeology and ethnography and the historical records, people who generally did not use horses. They were um, people who walked. Uh, but we do know that many tribes did eventually adopt horses and domesticate horses for their use as well. So now that we've gone, uh, gotten the domesticated animals uh, as well as the types of animals that were hunted out of the way, used by southwestern cultures out of the way, we now need to ask, uh, many of you are probably even asking, well, Dane, you know, the Southwest, the American Southwest is, for the most part, an arid desert. What could they have grown at all? Like, how could they have done agriculture in the American Southwest at all? Well, <laughs> the uh, to answer the question, they did this by using plants that were adapted to the desert um, environment itself. One of the earliest of these domesticated plants that they used was agave. And as you can see here, agave that can be used for a variety of food and medicinal pur purposes. And in fact, this is one of the key ingredients to a favorite of a lot of uh, people in the modern world, tequila. So the cultures of the American Southwest seeing the hardiness and the nutritional benefits of agave cultivated this plant in mass. We also know that eventually, after the domestication and the development of the Three Sisters method in Mesoamerica, that eventually the cultures of the American Southwest, the Pueblo cultures, the Magallon, the Hohokam, and eventually the various uh, other tribes like the Apache and uh, sorry, not the Apache, like the um, Navajo and other tribes, uh, the cultures of the American Southwest began to use beans, squash, specifically um, summer squash and winter, uh, or yeah, win yeah, winter squash, and corn, maize. Uh, and now we, you know, knowing what plants they used, we have to also ask, or you're all probably asking, well, I mean, that still doesn't answer the question. Yeah, you can say they used plants that were <laughs> suited for the desert environment, but beans and squash and corn aren't necessarily suited for the desert environment like agave is, and even then that doesn't tell us how they watered them, how they were able to produce food in large enough quantities to have any given population at all. Well, the how they did this was by irrigation uh, by creating canals. In fact, the Hohokam were particularly skilled at this. Uh, in fact, this picture you're looking at is a Hohokam irrigation canal. Uh, irrigation canal. Uh, and in fact, here's a map here of the various Hohokam irrigation, irrigation systems, and you can see uh, there's, you know, for scale showing what they are, uh, just for even this one little region alone, uh, they're pretty extensive. Uh, here's, and so using this irrigation technique, the various indigenous peoples of the American Southwest were able to, from, uh, for example, mountain rivers and things like that, mountain water sources were able to irrigate and procure enough water to grow a variety of plants, whether it be squash, beans, and corn in the Three Sisters method, a variety of 
edible cacti, such as prickly pears, uh, agave, etc. But it wasn't just that. In fact, uh, some cultures like the ancestral Puebloans used uh, another method to, to procure enough food for them to survive. So, a question, given the very arid and very uh, uh, nutrient light soil of the Chaco Halo, Chaco Ca uh, Canyon area, essentially it's not, there's not very much nutrients in the soil in the region, uh, archaeologists were faced with the question of where <laughs> where is essentially how how did the a, the ancestral Puebloans procure enough food for their population uh, to live in Chaco in the Chaco Halo Chaco Canyon area? And so, to answer this question, studies were conducted in the Chaco Halo area, the uh, Bandelier uh, Pajarito Plateau, uh, the Zuni area, and Mesa Verde. And what they found is that by far the uh, uh, while the Chaco Halo area could produce you know a couple of good years of uh, it's this to be clear the B the BUAC uh, marker is like the bushels of corn of maize that can be produced in any given. Uh, agricultural year. Uh, while they could get a couple of good years, as seen here with this uh, 25 uh, and a half bushels, uh, 13 and a half bushels, and uh, 14 and a half bushels, uh, by far the Bandelier area, as uh, seen here, the Mesa Verde area, the Zuni area, and of and the most productive, the Moorfield Valley area, uh, were far more productive than the Chaco Halo area. So this told archaeologists that the uh, that the inhabitants of the Chaco Halo Chaco Canyon area were able to mobilize various other communities in the Bandelier, Mesa Verde, Zuni, and Moorfield Valley, Valley area to produce food for them. And so they, whether it be uh, through the inhabitants of the Chaco Halo area being the elite, the uh, sort of aristocratic class, if you, if we could, if you wanted to find it that way, of the area, or be through just simply trade, uh, the inhabitants of the Chaco Halo area utilized the inhabitants of these other four areas to uh, obtain enough food. Um, and in fact, it, this means that most of the maize found in archaeological contexts in the Chaco Halo area probably came from one of these four areas. Uh, again, based off of <laughs> the uh, nutritional data, uh, probably from the Moorfield Valley area, um, or even from the closer Bandelier, Mesa Verde, and Zuni areas. The cultures of the American Southwest also used another very interesting and very important and often overlooked method to cultivate food, and that was the idea of controlled burning. So, as I stated in the beginning of the video, uh, with the defining terms, controlled burning is essentially starting a forest fire and monitoring it uh, in order to cultivate food as well as to uh, prevent later forest fires from happening by removing underbrush and other forms of kindling. An example of this, a modern example of this can be seen here with the forest right here being very dense with underbrush uh, and then looking like this. And so one might ask, well, yeah, we know this now in our modern life, but how do we know that the indigenous peoples of the Southwest did this in the past? Because, yeah, we, we can say 
you know, based off of the obvious pictures I just showed, that we in our modern United States society, among other countries, do this, but that doesn't say anything about people of the past. Well, we can do this by looking at the uh, the archaeo and paleobotanical data. So, by looking at the archaeo and paleobotanical data, like you see here, we can see that in the past, uh, through we can see in the past that. Uh, that a lot of fire, uh, low fire tolerance or non fire tolerant plants uh, were not present or were burnt down, while uh, high, uh, while high <laughs> uh, drought tolerant and high fire tolerant plants were endemic. In fact, this shows sort of the plants that were uh, being burnt and destroyed. Uh, we can also see that through the pollen, as you can see here, uh, with some pollens being less present and some pollens being more present. Also, uh, as seen in this picture, you can we look at the archaeology uh, were of essentially what is called uh, objects called firecracked rock or rock that was heated through fires, uh, usually through cooking events, uh, like a village cooking food, but also through forest fires. Uh, and we, through the archaeology, archaeologists have found that the cultures of the Southwest not only used the forest fires to uh, cultivate more fire-tolerant trees, but also it it helped them procure food uh, desirable foods. In fact, a lot of these firecracked rocks were found in context of breaking chestnuts and hickory nuts and various other nuts like that that have been cooked in these forest fires. And again, here's a look at the <laughs> amount of uh, of pollen that existed. <laughs> Uh, back in the 800s and the type of pollens that existed uh, and then those that exist now in the modern area, uh, era. Uh, and in fact, another important thing that has been determined based off of this um, archaeological, archaeobotanical, and paleobotanical data uh, shows that human-influenced vegetation uh, through fire actually has a, led to areas being cooler and wetter. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with a variety of things, uh, but specifically smoke being very cooling. And in fact, the modern tests on controlled burns, uh, modern use of controlled burns in studies have shown that the smoke from these controlled burns from these forest fires can actually cool streams and rivers which specifically in cases like the Pacific Northwest, which we'll get to in a little bit, uh, but also in the uh, American Southwest, allowed for more fish to come into uh, the rivers and spawn and increase their populations, like salmon and variety of other uh, of fish. Okay, so with the American Southwest out of the way, now we turn to the Pacific Northwest. So the Pacific Northwest, for the purposes of this video, because uh, sometimes it's a little more fluid, uh, includes Central and Northern California, and the, uh, excuse me, uh, and Washington, Oregon, uh, British Columbia, uh, and Southern Alaska, and a huge chunk of the Northwest Territory of. Uh, Canada. And as you can see, based off these maps, this these were very, very culturally diverse regions during this time. Like, I could not even begin to get into the, uh, to every single one of the cultural groups who was, who were present in this region. Uh, but of course, but, you know, just to give 
like a brief overview, you had people like the uh, the Shasta and the Modoc, and then you had the Tlingit uh, and the Haida, uh, the Chinook, etc. Uh, and one of the most common, uh, most commonly utilized food sources of the peoples of the Pacific Northwest was uh, cetaceans like whales and dolphins. In fact, as seen in this picture, uh, cultures like the Haida, which is this is a Haida uh, whaling canoe, would go out and eat, use harpoons and a variety of other things to hunt whale. They would also utilize the uh, fish in rivers, uh, like salmon, as you can see here. In fact, right here is a fishing net, a fishing weir that was used by a variety of cultures in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in fact, to this day, cultures like the Tlingit, the yeah, Tlingit uh, still rely heavily on fishing economies, like seen here from this picture of a Tlingit fishing rig uh, in 1905. But it wasn't just fish. Uh, the cultures of the Pacific Northwest also hunted. They hunted, uh, whether it be regular deer or caribou, reindeer, uh, depending on how far north or south they were, as uh, seen in this picture. But they also utilized the natural resources of the environment and collected a variety of nuts and berries, like as seen in this uh, 1920s, 1915 picture of a hickory, a hickory or, or walnut, I forget exactly which one, but a uh, storage container for used for storing nuts that they harvested during a, the season that nuts were most abundant. But it wasn't just that. Uh, like the Mesoamerica and the American Southwest, the cultures of the Pacific Northwest also domesticated dogs. In fact, some cultures uh, uh, domesticated dogs and used them for wool, which you can see here. This is called a wool dog. Um, it's no longer in existence. Uh, it, I, I believe it's died out. If anyone from the tri various tribes who used the wool dogs uh, still has them and they uh, and wants to correct me on them being still in existence, please feel free. I think it would be cool if they were still in existence, but from my understanding, they are now extinct. But it's still very fascinating and interesting how, <laughs> while uh, despite the absence of llamas and alpacas and you know that are endemic in the Andes and the absence of sheep and other wool uh, bringing in wool growing animals that were in uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa, the, the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest still developed a wool culture of their own, which I shouldn't be surprised at at all because as I've stated many times in other videos, the indigenous peoples of the Americas were in no way less advanced or very or only very slightly less advanced than the Euro cultures of Europe and Asia. And again, I tend to lean on they were not less advanced at all. And this is a prime example of that. But it wasn't just that. They also developed very interesting horticultural, agricultural methods. And one of these was the, the development of uh, controlled gardens. Uh, and essentially what you're seeing in this picture here is the cultures of Washington and Oregon cultivated um, uh, what are called wa potatoes, uh, sort of like smaller cousins of potatoes, uh, tubers essentially, by essentially, how to put this, they stacked the, they helped push the natural environment uh, in their favor to produce the most uh, of the, the most amount of these tubers as possible. And so how they did this is they packed 
uh, this sedimentary layer, sediment layer uh, 3W, with as much nutrient dense material as possible, and then blocked it off with these stone cobbles. And we can tell that these were placed here by humans by their uniformity, like how uniform and thought out their placement was. And so essentially, what this has shown is that isn't by placing a whole lot of charcoal and other nutrient-rich fertilizer in sediment layer three and then covering it with these stone cobbles, they could produce, as stated in this graph, the highest density of uh, Wapato tubers that, that they could, meaning they could have a lot more food to feed their communities as, a pay, as opposed to the amount of tubers that were being grown in, say, sedimentary layer two or um, the lower deposits. In fact, of course, the lowest deposit was sterile. And they would dig these tubers, these Wapato tubers, up using these wooden stakes like this that we can see here that, of course, we have via archaeology, as well as this via archaeology. And in fact, we've uh, we have modern day examples of the Wapato tubers that we can compare to the ones we found in the archaeology. Now we move on to the next thing and the, the next method used in the Pacific Northwest, which, you know, as I've stated with the Pacific, with the American Southwest, uh, this is a very common threat, horticultural technique used throughout America, and it will be a common thread you see through all categories, the use of controlled fires. So, well, again, we, we have to ask, well, how do we know they use controlled fires, and why? Well, for one thing, we can look at the, again, the, uh, the archaeological, archaeobotanical, and paleobotanical data and see that uh, based off of the archaeological record, the historical regions right here, the historical region, this is one region uh, looking at various different lines of evidence and data, uh, one had very much more diverse structures, uh, much more diverse uh, flora structures, like, uh, you know, uh, a lot of forest, a lot of grassland, a lot of shrubland, etc. Uh, the fuel loading was a lot more diverse. The uh, fire potential was more diverse, and the flame length was much. You know, it was far different. In fact, based off of the historical data, we can tell that the fire intensity of this region. When, when natural forest fires versus forest fires that were conducted by the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest uh, were between uh, had many much more low intensity to moderate intensity forest fires, while the modern day fire, uh, flame intensity and fire potential uh, one the fire potential is much more severe as you can see here, in the modern era. And pretty much across the board, the fire potential of the same region in the current era is from very high, it's from, it's from high to severe, uh, and a little moderate mixed in, meaning that we have far more powerful and far more frequent and far more severe this, yeah, far more severe, far more frequent uh, uh, forest fires in this one region alone in, compar in the modern day in comparison to when the region was being periodically uh, controlled through controlled burns. And we can, again, look, we look at the, the paleobotanical and archaeobotanical evidence where we can see uh, things like, let's see here, let's see here, yeah, evidence, uh, like fire scars indicate greater fire frequency than 
expected for natural fires in this one region. Uh, evidence consistent with prescribed fire uh, uh, or like the Arctic botanical evidence for this area showing archaeological evidence of commas and other parkland vegetation were no longer growing today. Uh, consistent with prescribed burning, uh, need to control for climate-driven vegetational uh, vegetation shifts. So, what that so so what that little line is saying is, while it, uh, while there does need to be control to determine whether or not this is uh, climate-driven uh, and not human-driven, there's a high level of certainty that this uh, presence of this more fire-resistant. Uh, uh, commas and other parkland vegetation across the board uh, was present due to the pretty consistent use of controlled burns by the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest. So now we move on to the probably the most well-known region of North America when it comes to the indigenous peoples of the Americas, the Great Plains. So the Great Plains is roughly, again, this is rather fluid. Uh, in fact, for the purpose of the study, I'm including parts of Canada, of southern Canada, uh, is a geographic region of North America that extends from the eastern parts of Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, uh, most of Texas, most of northern Texas, uh, Nebraska, etc., uh, as well as northern Canada and parts of northern Mexico. Uh, and it was home to a diverse amount of indigenous communities. Uh, some were here before, some migrated later, uh, such as the uh, Blackfeet, the Plains Cree, the Hidasta, the Crow, uh, etc., the Ojibwe, etc. Uh, and, of course, predominantly the communities who lived on the Great Plains lived in uh, housing units known as teepees, which were very ingenious, uh, ingen were, were created with a great deal of ingenuity behind them because they're easy to construct and take down. They were sturdy and storms and a variety of other things because, of course, the Great Plains are the tornado belt. Of the United States. Uh, they were warm in the winter uh, and cool in the summer, uh, and they could be easily transported. And in fact, as seen in this picture, one might not expect it, but there were actually what one could describe as tent cities, uh, TP cities. So you could have very large communities uh, and tribal groups uh, spread out over this area, who shared a cultural and communal society. But it wasn't just teepees in the in the Great Plains. Some communities, such as the Mandan, lived in uh, living units called wigwams, which are essentially these turf and wattle and daub and various other uh, easily constructed materials that you see here that, again, were very much like the teepee. They were warm in the, sun, uh, in the winter, cool in the summer. Um, and were sturdy in the weather and were easy to construct. And of course, one of the animals that, as I've said in the last three sections, one of the animals that they cultivated and um, adopted and domesticated were dogs, which they used, uh, as seen here, to pull objects like trabois, or these, uh, I don't want to say carts, but they're essentially perform the same uh, job, the same duty, uh, to pull and carry goods and other items for the community. As well as they were, uh, dogs were very useful, as always, in hunting animals. Which leads me to the most common animal that was hunted by the plain indigenous peoples of the uh, North American plains, and that is bison, like one you see here. 
and bison played a very key role in the life and society of the indigenous peoples of the North American plains. Uh, one, you can see they used them for clothing and ceremonial uses. So clothing over here, a Sioux warrior who was taken wearing, taking a, had this picture taking a, of them wearing this outfit, uh, as well as them using the buffalo headdresses uh, and, very, uh, and a variety of other clothing made out of buffalo, uh, sorry, a bison, made out of bison, and ceremonial dances like the bison dance. And of course, you know, here's a good example of the clothing they used. Uh, they would stretch it out for clothing, but also they would stretch it out and use it for record keeping and for artwork, as seen in this buckskin. That's our buffskin bison hide that you see here depicting horses riding, you know, ho wild horses riding. And before the introduction of horses, the indigenous peoples of the Great Plains of the uh, Great Plains of the North American continent would hunt at bison pretty much in the exact same way that the Paleo Indian ancestors did. So they would sneak up on them, either dressed as wolves or dogs. Also, would have dogs with them. Uh, one either would, you know, take down one or two, or you know, rather than a whole herd, or they would spook them and send them to buffalo jump sites, like seen in this one here, which is a buffalo jump site from, um, I believe, Wyoming, uh, that was used by the Blackfoot tribe. Mm. Where you can see they would uh, scare the bison to the gathering basin uh, and be, then be driven down. Uh, a would be the where they would scare them to the gathering basin. B would be where they would uh, drive them, uh, the driving lanes. Uh, C being the precipice where they would fall over. D would be where they would collect the bones and the food, at the bone bed. And E is where they would have their camp. So making it easy for them to come up and dispatch any of the bison that were still alive but very very badly hurt, uh, as well as to collect the ones who were actually dead. And as we can see here in this map, just in Montana and Alberta, Canada, and, and Saskatchewan, etc. alone in Idaho, there is a lot of bison jumps. Which makes sense, because this would be one of the easiest ways to get a large amount of food for these large living communities that were present. But eventually, this would change with the introduction of horses, uh, and bison jump sites would eventually be, for the most part, uh, at least to my understanding, I could be wrong, please, anybody from these cultures, uh, feel free to correct me, would uh, begin to abandon the bison jumps uh, for the use of horses and hunting them because it was far easier at that point to ride horses through and hunt them like this. And of course, on that note, eventually the various indigenous peoples of the North American Great Plains, with the introduction of horses, would domesticate horses of their own, uh, such as the, uh, uh, such as this crow individual here, and the Sioux individual here, and would essentially use become horse cultures, and would develop large herds of horses of their own, uh, and of course would use horses to carry their trois carts um, that dogs had previously filled in the role for. But what one might not expect is it wasn't just bison or and also deer. I should also mention that deer was hunted as well. Uh, but it wasn't just meat uh, fauna. It wasn't just fauna food goods that were utilized by the cultures of the North American Great Plains, but also Agriculture uh, was practiced on the uh, Great Plains as well, uh, such as the harvest of corn, where you can see this in this picture of this traditional corn drying 
rack of sorts that was used by the indigenous peoples of the North American Great Plains. Uh, and in fact, as you can see here, the archaeobotanical and uh, the archaeological and archaeobotanical record show can show us the uh, types of uh, plants that were cultivated, uh, with corn being cultivated in great amounts, uh, specifically in the eastern plains and the western plains. Uh, uh, also, squash to a certain degree. Some flower seeds to a certain degree, marsh elder, drop seed, little barley, etc. Uh, meaning, so showing that they actually had a diverse, the indigenous peoples of the North American Great Plains, despite common belief that, like you say, you see in Hollywood, they actually had a very diverse uh, diet. They had a very, very diverse diet compared to what one might expect. Uh, in fact, here's here's the graph continued showing how much corn was domesticated, um, as well as some uh, tobacco, beans, squash, sunflower, etc. In fact, we know from archaeology that the domestication of corn and beans and those various other agricultural goods went as far up as the uh, boreal forest and the taiga in the subarctic region of the North American Great Plains. Because again, the Great Plains actually extend a lot farther north than just the American Canadian border. Now we move on to, again, the common thread. Uh, <clears throat> the tribes of the, the indigenous peoples of the Great Plains, like the other three, sorry, yeah, the other, uh, like the other three sections utilized controlled burns to their benefit, uh, as seen by this burn of the prairie right here. Uh, in fact, what we see here is the, we, we can actually tell in our, based off of the archaeology and archaeobotanical data, the time periods in which this use of controlled burns uh, in which these controlled burns were utilized. And you can see that they start roughly around 1050 CE um, and are used to some degree here in the 1150s, but they really begin to take off. The use of them really begins to take off in the 1200s uh, CEs through the 1650s CEs. And here's a similar graph right here uh, with uh, these charcoal deposits right here. And these are the ones that are directly dated. And you can again see the amount that they are and they still correlate with, sorry, not correlate, they still match up pretty perfectly with the time period of like the roughly the 13th century CE to the 16th uh, to the 17th century CE or AD, depending on how you want to measure it. And so, one might ask, well, why did they use these controlled fires? Did they use them in a similar way to the you know, cultures of the American Southwest and the Pacific Northwest uh, to control the frequency of intense? forest fires as well as to cultivate food or was it from for a different reason well it's the latter uh what they used these controlled fires for now i should be clear i'm sure they used it to a certain degree to come uh, to help uh cultivate the fertility the uh, how nutrient dense the soil is for their crops like corn and beans and tobacco and things like that but by are the use of controlled fires by the indigenous peoples of the North American Great Plains matches up almost perfectly with pedestrian bison hunting, i.e. hunting bison by, feet, uh, by foot. And again, here we go. We see this same timeline ma uh, match up. We're in the 1200s CE through the 1650s CE. The 
uh, use of controlled burnings uh, is exactly during the time period that bison were hunted on foot and the these bison jumps, these precipices where bison were driven off cliffs to their deaths or to their uh, mortal injury for hunting uh, is right in that window. And then when the uh, controlled burnings stop or at least go down to a great degree is when we begin to, is when we see the adoption of and domestication of horses, uh, i.e. equestrian bison hunting, where we see very little, I mean, a couple of little spots, but very little uh, events of controlled burning. So there you have it. So in a way, the controlled burning, uh, the practice of controlled burning was used in the same way as the people, cultures of the Pacific Northwest and the American Southwest to cultivate desi uh, desirable food but it was also a little bit different as that desired food was bison and it was to scare the bison to their uh, to one to their deaths by you know to essentially jump off cliffs to their deaths <laughs> all right so now on to the next section and that is the great basin region of north america so the great basin Roughly, again, as all, as all with the other regions, uh, it's more fluid. Um, roughly encompasses uh, eastern Oregon, southern Idaho, the western Utah, and western Wyoming, and southern California. Though, again, as I said, it's more fluid because southern California also is part of the American Southwest. With the tribes who began to inhabit the this area, including earlier cultures like the Fremont culture, uh, as well as eventually the Shoshone, uh, the Paiute, the Ute, uh, among others, and like the cultures of the American Great Plains, and again, it's because the American Great Plains and the Great Basin. Uh, have a very fluid boundary. The cultures of the Great Basin lived in teepees. And again, this was for the same reason that the, the cultures in the Great Plains used it. It was a very ingenious tool for the purposes they needed. And the peoples of the Great Basin, uh, like, again, all the other sections, one of their main staples of food subsistence methods was hunting. They hunted pygmy rabbits, which they used for food as well as to make clothing, as seen in this uh, Paiute, uh, sorry, Ute, uh, this Ute um, cloak made from pygmy rabbits. They also hunted deer, which they used to, for food and to make clothing, like this buckskin dress uh, or shirt. They also hunted large amounts of rodents, like the kangaroo mouse, which is still endemic in the Great Basin area. Uh, and they also hunted waterfowl, like ducks and Canada geese, uh, which is evidenced both by the presence of their faunal remains, their bones in the archaeological record, but also the presence of these decoy ducks from the archaeological record. Uh, very much like is used in duck hunting now, as well as in recreational feeding of ducks, the cultures of the Great Basin would create these stuffed duck, fake duck decoys to lure other ducks into the lake to hunt. Very ingenious, and again, it proves that they were in no way less advanced than even what we are today, because we still use these techniques. <laughs> uh, but and, and then here's a graph of some of the most common faunal remains with uh, with rodents and uh, let's see what I'm saying. yeah yeah with with rabbits and ducks and deer specifically rabbits ducks and hares uh, birds and mammals being the most prominent that were used so of course there were some mountain sheep. 
an antelope that was used it for food sources as well, as well as some leopards, uh, essentially uh, r uh, rabbits and things like that. But they also, so, so let me put it this way, the cultures of the Great Basin didn't practice agriculture like the Great Plains did, uh, at least not to the same degree, or uh, like the American Southwest, they were much more like the cultures in the neighboring Pacific Northwest. They used horticulture. In essence, they utilized and cultivated native plants. And so they one of, some of these included uh, amaranth and saltbrush, which can be used for food and medicinal purposes, uh, shad scale and seepweed, uh, as well as others such as spurge uh, and sedge and barnyard grass, which with seepweed, uh, with plants such as seepweed uh, and sedge uh, being used for medicinal purposes. And in fact, as you can see, shad scale and amaranth seem to have been among the most important ones that were used. In fact, amaranth seems to have been cultivated to a very high degree. Sorry, let me correct myself. I just said <laughs> that they didn't use maize uh, in agriculture. They did. Uh, they very much did. I, I apologize. I had, it, it, it slipped my mind, but we do actually have evidence that they at least in, at least subsisted off of maize, as we can see in these burned kernels. In fact, as we can see here, we can see sort of the cob length and diameter of what they used. Uh, meaning that they did actually, at least whether they grew it themselves or traded with, again, the nearby American Southwestern cultures, they did utilize corn and maize. And then, like the cultures of the American Southwest uh, and the Great Plains, eventually the horse was introduced and domesticated by the Ute and Paiute and other tribal peoples of the Great Basin, which they used like the cultures of the American Southwest and the Great Plains for hunting and warfare and to Great Houston developed their own large herds and uh, their own large herds of horses. In fact, the Paiute and the Ute were specifically known for their very desired breeds of horse. And then they also used controlled fires, which I'm sure at this point nobody is surprised by, by how often I brought it up. <clears throat> so again, we, so we, we ask as always, why did they use controlled fi you know, fires. Why did they set fire to forests? Uh, and here are a variety of reasons of why they did it. Uh, to divert big game species into small unburned, a unburned areas for easier hunting. To improve harvest, uh, such as berry production, uh, clear ground for planting, to improve grazing and browsing potential, etc., etc. Pest management, uh, to signal warfare, what have you. And again, we, we've got quite a lot of evidence, This in this case, uh, from the historical record, because we can actually see, we actually have documents from explorers like uh, individuals such as Escalante uh, on downwards, starting in, like, for example, 1776, where they describe meadows and pastures recently burned, um, as well as one Bryant, one explorer Bryant, as he came through Utah, saw a smoke column rising from the mountains in the west, and he saw another one just a few days later, uh, fire raging on the mountain all night, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the way down into the 1850s. So, so in essence, we have. We know why they use the fire they, for the variety of uses to divert, uh, divert game and control pests and, very, and various other things. And we know that they did this for a very long time based off of the historical record.
Um, we have a very long record of this. <laughs> now we move on to the next section. Alaska and the Arctic. So, the uh, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to include the Arctic, uh, the two different, dis very distinct regions of the Arctic. Uh, the subarctic, which, as I said in the Great Plains video, uh, overlaps with the Great Plains. In fact, the Cree were both an Arctic and a Great Plains people, uh, are both an Arctic and Great Plains people, because they still exist. <clears throat> Uh, and then we have the Arctic, which roughly, sorry, so let me go back. The subarctic goes from central Canada up into the eastern part of Alaska. And then the Arctic is from northern Canada, uh, around southern, really most of Greenland, and northern, western, and southern Alaska, as you can see here. And I'm including these two geographic regions together because, again, like like the Great Plains, these these are really fluid, and really the boundary between subarctic and Arctic is not always very clear. And the peoples of the let me go back as always as I have with the other two, uh, and the peoples of the subarctic included, but we're not excluding to the Ojibwe, the Cree, the uh, Taniania. Again, apologies for possibly butchering this. <laughs> uh, is, and then the Arctic included peoples such as the uh, various Inuit groups that include the Central Alaskan Yupik the Aleut peoples, the North Alaskan Inuit, and the, the West and Eastern, uh, East Greenland Inuit groups. Uh, and in this geographic, these geographic regions, the indigenous peoples of the subarctic and Arctic lived in one uh, teepee-like tents that are, were again ingenious, ingeniously that were defined with a certain amount of ingenuity, excuse me, ingenuity, <laughs> sorry for the tongue slips, for, of ingenuity behind them, uh, with the, some of them, one being covered in snow, which helped actually provide a large amount of insulation in the harsh winters, or being covered in things like buckskin, uh, caribou skin, buffalo skin, etc. Or they would build uh, dwellings deep, not deep in the ground, but into the ground like you see here, uh, where you have it covered in sod and soil and snow to insulate it, and you have an entrance right here that you can go through uh, and smoke vents. Again, very ingeniously developed to help improve the quality of life and keep people warm and you can see they're they're a decent sized family group can live in this and then of course the most commonly and most well not most common but the most well known dwelling used in the arctic and subarctic and arctic is the igloo which again uh the snow packed so finely and densely actually insulated and made the dwelling very warm and again you could have a some decently sized living group living in any of these given igloos. And the traditional food of these peoples was it, very similarly, similar to, but also in some ways different to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, um, animals such as seals, like you see here, caribou, as well as whales. In fact, the Inuit and the Tlingit and the other cultures uh, of the Pacific Northwest, subarctic and Arctic, whaled and continue to whale to this day. Uh, in fact, blubber, coming, which comes from seals and whales, is very nutrient dense and also very fat dense, which you want in these very cold environments because it helps keep you warm. And of course, the caribou could be used for their high-protein meat, their high-nutrient meat, 
but also could be used for fur clothing for warmth, as well as for dwellings, like the tent at the beginning of the section. Uh, they also hunted and still continue to hunt um, Arctic rabbits and Arctic, well, it's Arctic waterfowl like Arctic ducks, like you see here. As well as they hunted lynx and beaver and even bear. That's right. The uh, the Aleut, the Inuit, the Yupik, etc. hunted and still to this day, to a degree, hunt polar bears. Which again, very good protein source and their fur is very well designed by evolution and environment to be warm. And in fact, I believe that's even a, the individual right here is even wearing a polar bear coat. I could be wrong because it's hard to tell, but that's what it looks like to me. And so we can see here, again, based off of archaeology, the frequent, which animals were much more frequent. It, with seals and, uh, and whales being very present, caribou, of course, being very present, but also uh, birds... Uh, let's see, where's the beaver? Uh, dogs like wolf, bear. I saw the beaver somewhere. Oh, yeah, and beaver and some beaver. Not to the degree of the other ones like birds and seal, whale, bear, caribou, etc. But still, we do know that they ate beaver. And then here's the amount of mammal. <laughs> of mem of uh, mammal bones found, as well as whaling bones found. They also, much like the Pacific Northwest, used horticulture to obtain food or uh, other food outside of meat, uh, such as black crowberry and cloudberry. Uh, willow, rose bay, willow herb, and seaweed. Because, as I said at the very beginning of the video, seaweed is still a food source that is utilized heavily by many cultures, whether it be Japan or in the subarctic and arctic, and even, I believe, uh, though I forgot to mention it, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in fact, the Cree, uh, specifically the Cree both in the subarctic plains and up in the Arctic, still to this day, as seen in this picture, harvest berries like uh, cranberries to use in cooking. In fact, here they are. Here's a Cree, that same Cree individual cooking beaver right here. Yeah, again, beaver was a food source for the peoples of the subarctic and Arctic. Uh, we also know, uh, as is very made very famous by movies like Balto, that the peoples of the Arctic and subarctic domesticated dogs for both use in hunting as well as use in the very famous dog sleds. So therefore transportation and of course protection. In fact, some of the most common to, uh, still extant uh, bre pre-Columbian breeds are the are are breeds such as the Alaskan Malamute and the Canadian Eskimo dog, as well as the Greenland dog and the uh, Tahultan bear dog, which actually I believe so. Let me correct myself. I believe the Tahultan bear dog is no longer extant. Um, I could be wrong. Again, any people from any of these indigenous groups who breed these dogs, if y'all still use these dogs, please feel free to correct me. Okay, so now we move on to our last section, the Eastern Woodlands. So the Eastern Woodlands broadly, again, as, as with every other section, this is much more fluid. The boundaries of the, of the section are much more fluid. But generally, the Eastern Woodlands are the area consisting of uh, East Texas, uh, Southern uh, sorry, eastern Oklahoma, southern Arkansas, eastern Missouri, uh, all through the American Southeast, uh, and the American Northeast. 
and the tribes that inhabited these regions, for example, in the American Southeast, included people, uh, tribes such as the Cherokee, the uh, Yamasi, the, Hit uh, the Hitichi, the Muscogee, more commonly known as the Creek, the Appalachie, uh, and in the Northeast, the various tribes that resided here and still reside here uh, in some degree included the Sock and Fox, uh, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, the various tribes that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, more commonly known as the Iroquois, but again, more, as always, the more properly known uh, Haudenosaunee, which were the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and also a little bit the Mohican, uh, the Powhatan tribe, etc. And also, as with every other region, the uh, more common, I'm going to put it this way, the culture and societies of, this, uh, of the Eastern Woodlands were, like all the, like the other regions I mentioned, very culturally sophisticated and diverse. Uh, but very similar to Mesoamerica and the American Southwest, we see in the Eastern Woodlands the development of large city-like, or in many cases, literal cities, settlements. Um, as far back even as... Um, is uh, 5,000 years ago. So, for example, we see you here, right here this uh, this historic site and this settlement in Louisiana, Poverty Point, which was built at the same time as the Great Pyramids were being excuse me were being built in Egypt uh, in the roughly the archaic period of the Eastern Woodlands. Um, and then we have in the early early woodland period, we have cultures such as the Adena who are building mounds such as Serpent's Mound. Uh, and then we have the Hopo Mounds being built throughout the southeast, including in Georgia with sites such as uh, the Leak Site and Kolomoki, or these mounds that you see here that are found in the Hopo um, the uh, Center of Hopewell Cultural Power in Ohio. And then, of course, the very well-known Mississippian cultures, where we see who built large cities, such as Cahokia, which was the New York of the time, and then Etowah, which, as my mentor uh, has put it very aptly, uh, rivaled another site, Moundville, which was built in Alabama, to be the Atlanta of the time, with populations ranging 50,000 for Cahokia, if not more, which, to be clear, London had about 10,000 to 20,000, and Etowah between 15,000 to 20,000, maybe even 30,000 individuals. The same goes for Moundville. So, with that, we have to ask, you know, with these large political entities, with these large political centers, what was the food they used? Well, they, of course, they, like all the other sections, the cultures of the eastern woodlands hunted animals like deer, as well as turkey. And in fact, in the case of turkey, we have a lot of evidence showing that, to a certain degree, turkey and deer as well were cultivated. In fact, so essentially, what the data shows is the turkey in this in this particular study I'm referencing were cultivated to produce larger male uh, individuals through the use of horticulture, um, like controlled burning, which we'll get to again at the end of this section, as well as management of the various flora and uh, plant life that grew in the underbrush. So essentially what this is saying is that the indigenous peoples of the eastern woodlands, uh, in, the, in the case of this particular study, Tennessee, used a sort of a free-range method to domesticate, or at least semi-domesticate, turkeys. 
because turkeys are other than birds of prey like hawks and eagles uh, and and other birds such as ravens are one of the few birds that are depicted in eastern woodland artwork on on pottery and such showing how significant they are and then along with that the presence of turkey bones in the archaeological con archaeological excuse me archaeological record is second only to deer meaning that turkey and deer were the two most utilized animal food sources of the eastern woodlands but it wasn't just that, or sorry, of the eastern woodlands uh, around Georgia and going up. But one of the most utilized food sources of the southern eastern woodlands uh, around South Georgia, South Alabama, South Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida, uh, as well as parts of eastern North Carolina and South Carolina, was alligators. So we can we actually have archaeological and historical records. Uh, showing the use of alligators as a food source by tribes such as the Tamuqua, the Wali, and the Appalachee, where they would use methods uh, such as firing arrows at them, like you can see here, and also <laughs> impaling the alligators on large skewers where they would be taken over to buildings like this right here and smoked and cooked. Uh, anybody who's every, who's let me put it this way. Alligator is incredibly delicious, and I'll, if you've never eaten it and you're ever in the uh, coastal plain of the American Southeast, I highly recommend it. Uh, so I definitely understand why they would use this food source. But it wasn't just that. Uh, specifically, in the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coast of the American Southeast, you would see, as well as the coast of the of the northeast, you would see the utilization of marine life as well. Uh, in the case of this from Florida, the weed, in, uh, the weed and island cultures would utilize food sources such as sea turtle, red drum, black drum, mullet, uh, but also you would find in archaeological context in the north, uh, in the northeast, the use of uh, Atlantic herring, uh, in some cases, well as well, uh, tuna, etc. Also, something that is pretty endemic throughout the eastern woodlands is the use of fresh and saltwater shellfish, mussels. Uh, these are freshwater clams, freshwater mussels that were utilized, and we also have freshwater snails like dolnax that were used, uh, as well as oysters and uh, other saltwater shellfish. And then eventually, with, with the adoption of horses, we begin to see the domestication of horses and the development of horse cultures, which one might be surprised because the cultures of the eastern woodlands like the Cherokee, the Muscogee Creek, and the Choctaw and such were not are not often portrayed or uh, by popular culture as horse cultures, but that's in direct opposition to the historical fact. And in fact, some cultures after the adoption of horses, like the Choctaw, began to develop ranching cultures and horse cultures around that. And then we also have other tribes like the Cherokee and the Muscogee Creek who would use horses in law enforcement capacities, uh, such as the Cherokee Light Horse Divisions, who were the, essentially the police force of the Cherokee Nation. Another interesting animal that was introduced by Europeans and eventually domesticated was the pig, which shouldn't be surprising because pig domestication is pretty endemic throughout the U.S., but the Cherokee and other southeastern woodland tribes would domesticate pigs because one they provide as as anyone's ever as knows who's ever raised pigs a large amount of food, a large amount of meat and nutrients. But you but you can also uh, breed a lot of them. In fact, <laughs> pigs are, have a tendency to breed like. One, one we could say like breed like rabbits, but 
pigs, that's essentially how pigs breed. In fact, that's why both in the American South and the Southeast here in Georgia and Florida and Alabama and such, as well as in Canada and the Great Plains, wild pigs are a pretty big issue because of how quickly they can uh, multiply. To put it that way. So that multiplication me it meant to tribes like the Cherokee and other in other southeastern woodland tribes, they could produce a lot of food for their communities. In fact, as Charles Hicks, a Cherokee politician from the in the 1820s, put uh, puts it, they could produce a lot more food at that point in time than they had ever in the past with deer and turkey. Now. I don't know how much of that is true, to be fair. I, that's just one Cherokee individual, and he's not a monolith. But that still says a lot about the domestication of pigs by the cultures of the American Southeast after contact with Europeans. And here we go here with one of those graphs based off of archaeology, uh, off of a couple of sites in Tennessee, showing their, the Eastern Woodlands tribe's use of that primary forest efficiency that I mentioned, which, to go back over, essentially primary forest efficiency is that utilization of horticulture to control the food sources of your region to give you more, uh, not only larger amounts of food, but more desirable amounts of food uh, through either the turkey domestication of free range or the control use of controlled fire, what have you. Uh, and so with that in mind, we can see what the use of primary force efficiency theory uh, hypothesis shows, and we can see the amounts of food that was more common in these communities, which included things like soft-shell turtle, intermediate turtle, uh, intermediate large, uh, large mammals, small mammals. Uh, for more specific, you can get over here and see Things like white-tailed deer and rabbit, uh, mouse, squirrel, uh, reptiles like turtles, as well as non-poisonous snakes, what have you. As well as fish like freshwater drum and intermediate large fishes. Meaning that they utilize... So, th so this shows us the... Like I said with the turkey the section how <laughs> the, how deer was one of the one of the most common if not the most common food utilized by the south by the eastern woodlands tribes and then yeah and then we also have the, over here and the, with this graph we can see the types of shellfish and gastropods that were used with Things like shark eye being used to a uh, great amount, uh, whelk, uh, oysters, clams, you name it. Uh, and trust me, as somebody who is can, who has participated in, that, in excavations on the Atlantic coast where these shellfish are most common, you find a lot of them in the archaeological context. But it wasn't just, as always, it wasn't just the meat sources that you found and that, that were used here. Uh, we have examples of both, both human-cultivated and naturally-cultivated plants that were used by the cultures of the American, of the American Eastern Woodlands, uh, such as Yupon Holly, which was has been described by explorers such as uh, William Bartram, who explored the Southeast and uh, wrote a great deal about the various tribes, such as Cherokee, the Yamasee, and the Muscogee Creek. And he talks about how Yupon Holly was used to create a ceremonial drink known as the Black Drink. Then we also know from both the historical and archaeological record how, uh, how much uh, Eastern Walnut was cultivated, like you see here. And then, of course, the, the 
three sisters method was used in this region, i.e. the use of squash, beans, and corn together in a symbiotic relationship. In fact, the use of, of corn, squash, and beans in the eastern woodlands is what is one of the key factors that allowed for population booms uh, in areas like uh, Cahokia that you can see right here behind me uh, in Etowah, the population booms of the middle woodland and eastern wood, uh, middle woodland, uh, the middle woodland, late woodland, and Mississippian periods, uh, as well as the fact that the sheer, the the how endemic the Three Sisters method was to the eastern woodlands by the sheer amount of cultures of the indigenous cultures of the eastern woodlands who have one uh, one variation of the or the other of the story of the corn mother or the individual who brought either brought corn or was introduced to corn by the great spirit or what have you to the eastern woodlands and here we have one of these graphs where we can see again the types of food that we can that we find in many of these contexts uh with uh, for example, with the this these grass are with the Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, and, and Yuchi peoples, but we can see large amounts of wild potato, wild onion. Uh, in some groups, some groups used um, groundnut and sassafras. Large amounts of of wild strawberries, mulberries, blackberries, huckleberries, wild grapes, crab apples. Walnut, chestnut, hickory, uh, of course, mussels, turtle eggs, etc. And you can see just the sheer amount of animals they would use. They would also use techniques for catching fish, such as uh, using devil's shoestring, Carolina moonseed, buckeye, uh, walnut, etc., to poison a fish, to catch fish. Uh, using po these poisonous fruits and nuts, as well as, of course, bows and arrows, hand nets, spears, etc. And here's another continuation of the graph with mammals showing, again, the predominance of animal like white-tailed de white deer uh, and wild turkey. And then, of course, we come back, like with every other section, the use of controlled burns to can, to cultivate and control food sources as well as to control the severity of fires. Because in fact, the how to put this, in fact, the def, the term that I defined at the beginning of the video, primary forest efficiency, includes the use of controlled burns in its de uh, definition. And so with this, you can, how we tell, can tell that the tribes of the eastern woodlands used controlled burns to, to their benefit is, again, with the archaeobotanical and archaeological and paleobotanical data. So we can see, for example, this is in the northeast, uh, the presence of which which types of trees were present and weren't present, with the negative dashes meaning they weren't present, uh, or were and with like one for example one negative dash meaning not uh, not very present uh, or not present, and then the three dashes meaning let me double check the little graph here. Uh, okay, so this one. Yeah, yeah, it, it indicates just how unimportant or how unpresent these trees were. Uh, and the same goes for the positive dashes, uh, the positive marks. You know, with one positive mark meaning it was present, and then the more positive marks meaning it was very present. You know, like present, present to a decent degree, incredibly present, like white oak. And this, we can see the same thing with the presence of like what types of trees were present at the time as well by the fact of how pyrophobic they are or how fire tolerant uh, that they were uh we, in essence all of these trees are very pyrophobic <clears throat> uh, and we can see them in their 
pollen representation with the most common pollen representative in the archaeobotanical record being those like oak, uh, pine, and birch, as well as elm. And a lot of these have to do with, as well, how shade tolerant they are as well, with, for example, birch being shade intolerant, but also oak being uh, intermediate. So in essence, these trees are intolerant to the shade, so they need more sunlight to grow. So, i.e., controlled burn come in, burn off all the underbrush and all the cover that is preventing these trees from growing. And that's why we see more of them present, as well as the fact that they were much more fire and drought tolerant. And again, here we go. We have the accessibility of things like oak and whether it be black oak or white oak, hickory, and chestnut, uh, from the late woodland to the historic period of the Haudenosaunee. And uh, we can see just how, much, for example, black oak is pretty much accessible all across the board, and same with chestnut and things like that. Uh, and again, here's another graph that you, I'm not going to go through all of it, but you can see uh, versus the prohistoric and the present, uh, how much pollen is present based off of which ones were fire tolerant and fire intolerant, uh, showing which ones are present due to the cultivation of them through controlled burning. Further evidence for the utilization of prescribed or controlled burns in the eastern woodlands in order to cultivate desired food sources as well as to control the severity of future forest fires can be found in the southeastern part of the eastern woodlands, the southeastern United States. One of the such cases that we can look at, one of the such evidences we can look at, is the Horse Cove Bog in Macon County, North Carolina. Now, I do understand that this graph and the other one I'm about to talk about are obviously screenshots, and I do realize that the quality is not optimal of either of these screenshots, and I apologize. However, unforeseen technical difficulties made it impossible for me to properly copy the graphs for this PowerPoint. That being said, now we look at these graphs. So, as I've said before, with all the other cases of prescribed burnings, of, con of controlled burnings, in order to cultivate these food sources and to control the severity of future forest fires, we have to look at the archaeological, archaeobotanical, and paleobotanical data. And in the case of the horse Cove bog, we have uh, one of these cases where we looked at all of that. Uh, and what the study of the Horse Cove bog has shown is that the bog pretty much accumulated, essentially the bog, Horse Cove bog is a sediment sequence of ash and charcoal and other byproducts of these controlled burnings. And what the archaeologists found is that the controlled burnings Start, started probably, maybe, extrapolated around 1986 BCE, or BC, depending on how you want to measure it, and pretty much confirmed the started around 1890 BCE or BC. And then from those, from the starting period, whether it be the extrapolated starting period of 1986 BCE or 1890, or the confirmed starting period of 1890 BCE, the accumulation of the ash and of the charcoal and the other byproducts of these controlled burnings pretty much continued steadily up until about 1425 CE or AD, depending on your um, measurement system. And even then, it still continued to some degree of consistency up until about 1900, but really about 1830, 1900-ish. And so what this shows is that the controlled burnings were actually pretty continuous for about a 3,500 to 4,000 year time span, uh, showing that the use of 
controlled burnings, uh, prescribed burnings of woodlands to cultivate these food sources and to control future forest fires has been going on in the south, in the eastern woodlands for thousands of years, pretty much unbroken. So a, a several, a four to three, 3,500 to 4,000 year time period of unbroken use of prescribed burnings to accomplish this. Uh, and you can see the sediment depth is pretty much consistent across this time, time period, uh, with generally the sediment depth being about six centimeters, going up to about eight centimeters at the start of historic logging, uh, and then going down in the modern era with the time span going anywhere between uh, of burns going anywhere between 2340 years to even 745 years and 405 years with a deposition rate uh, roughly between 270 sorry 124 uh, to 390 centimeters a year depending on the vast stretch of time period because of course it's, it's important to note that there are obvious gaps between use, but those little gaps are still very minimal when one considers that the deposition rate and the burning rate was pretty much the same over these 3,000 years. And using the, this archaeobotanical data, looking at the ash, we can see, you look at the pollen counts as well and see, based off of these pollen counts, which trees were more common, which trees were essentially uh, endemic during this time period. And as you can see, the tree that is most common in, in the southeastern United States, as well as, as we talked about earlier, in the northeastern United States, uh, northeastern woodlands, uh, is oak. So oak, both in the northeastern and southeastern woodlands, is pretty much uniform. Uh, oak pollen is pretty much uniform throughout this time period. Again, that has a lot to do with the fact that oak is a pretty pyrophobic, uh, essentially fire-tolerant, drought-tolerant tree. Uh, and then also during this time period, though not quite as consistent, uh, but still fairly consistent, you see chestnut, which again is a not only a fairly fire resistant tree, not as fire resistant as oak, but still, uh, but it's also, it's one of these trees where, whose seeds often rely on heat in order to germinate and bloom. The same can be said for pine, because many pine cone, uh, many pine species, the pine cones require that as well. And then you can see all the other trees that are very much less common than the three most common trees, pine, uh, oak, chestnut, and pine, all of which are pretty fire resistant, uh, as well as some fire resistant to a certain degree, grasses, birch, etc. And then other pollen counts being minimal, like in maize, which of course is not fire resistant at all. I'm sorry, I've never heard of anything or seen anything of corn being able to be resistant to fire, and you can see generally that with the majority of this. So this, like with the pollen counts and the uh, and the frequency of the various types of trees in the northeastern United States, tells us what trees and plants the indigenous uh, the indigenous peoples of the southeastern United States were trying to control for and through their prescribed burnings. Okay, so with that, that ends the video. Uh, I know it was a very long video, <laughs> to say the least, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from it. And if you want to see me cover any of these regions or any of these subjects in more depth in later videos, uh, or you just simply have questions about the video overall, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section and feel free to, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And I hope you all have a good day.